Okay, and take it away. All right, um, well, I'm Liz Lefkin. And I'm Eugene Robinson, S. Robinson. <laughs> and we are from um, Ozzy. Uh, we are hot off the press. We launched last Monday. There's a reason why I'm wearing glasses instead of my usual contact lenses. Uh, startups are really fun. It has been super exciting. Uh, the reaction has been uh, great. Uh, just today, um, the CEO stepped out and said, oh, here are the latest people that have been um, looking and commenting um, on Aussie, uh, and it included Brian Williams and Rupert Murdoch. So it was kind of interesting, I think, for and, me. And, and Bono. And that's right. Oh, here's my hand. Whoever kidding, that is. Kidding, <laughs> kidding, 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 of course. Um, but it was very interesting. Um, we've been in this little bubble in Mountain View and sort of just thinking about um, getting it right uh, over and over again. And to hear that is uh, terrifically exciting. Um, so for me, actually, it was a really great reminder of um, what the opportunities are nowadays. When I first got into journalism, the barriers to entry were extremely high. You had to own a printing press, really, if you wanted to reach people. You had to have access to newsstands and, and trucks. And now there's tons of great opportunities here um, to start something and to do something new and different. And I think Ozzy really takes advantage of that. But um, I just wanted to offer that perspective uh, as you guys are thinking about what you're going to be doing next, that um, the opportunities that I see now for excellent media are unlike anything that I've experienced in many decades of um, journalism. So it's just a really terrifically um, exciting time to be in the media business. Agreed. Uh, agreed. My name, again, is Eugene S. Robinson, and I'm deputy editor of uh, Ozzy. Uh, when Ozzy initially started, it was uh, Carlos Watson uh, <laughs> calling meetings in a coffee shop in Mountain View. And, you know, you have a kind of idea that maybe proof of concept. You kind of always wonder whether or not the people around you maybe are crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the concept initially was really super solid. And it was, as a journalist, something that, you know, for at least two decades I'd been whining and complaining about. So it was nice to have somebody actually come to the fore and say, all that whining and complaining you've done, there's no need to do that anymore. You can actually fully actualize what you've thought in terms of media and how it's presented and how people read it and consume it. You can do that here. If you have a crazy idea, no idea will be too crazy for me. And to actually have it happen in very much that same way, um, it's been a, a thrilling seven-day-a-week, 18-hour-a-day ride. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's my brief intro. So. Exactly. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to talk about Ozzy um, a little bit. And I know that um, some people um, who may be following along won't see our screen. Um, we're on Ozzy.com at the moment. Yes. And we're just going to start by uh, talking about the um, mix. Uh, so right now I'm scrolling down to the presidential daily brief. And um, as um, I was quoted in the um, blog, um, this is an idea that I've had for a long time. Um, many years ago, I sat around a conference table much like this, mm -hmm. usually with a bunch of other guys. They were all section editors, managing editors at the San Francisco Chronicle. You came in every day at 10 o'clock and at 2.30 with your um, printout of all the top stories that you had for your section. It had a slug, a headline, and a brief description. And I was a feature editor, and I was the entertainment editor, so I was very involved in those things. But it was so fascinating that the international editor could come in mm -hmm. and say, okay, here's what's going on in these three places, and look for this to happen, and if that happens, then look out for that. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, why don't we put that in the newspaper? Because honestly, that's all I really need. I'm not going to go deep. And in fact, when I would look at the paper the next day, none of that context was present. And, and it's not to single out the Chronicle. Everybody does that. In fact, many people still do. Um, what you find are incremental updates, uh, stories that are aimed at people who have a pretty deep understanding of a topic, as opposed to somebody who's just coming in. Uh, so I'd been having conversations through the years with all kinds of very interesting people. Uh, Mike Davidson, um, who is now a VP at Twitter, posted a really fascinating uh, piece about a year and a half ago basically saying, I want a presidential daily brief. I want something that tells me the 10 things I need to know and so I can get on with my life. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something really significant that's happening in our world now. Even as we have so many opportunities to read things, you're so overwhelmed and you really need somebody not just to aggregate, but to provide context and to tell you what's happening next. Um, and by virtue of my um, stint um, on the East Coast in the D.C. area, you start to, you know, it's a company town, right? 
you hear about these briefings and everything, and I said, yes, a presidential daily brief, and we want it customized. Um, so this is the centerpiece of what we do at Aussie. And what we have are the um, most important stories, and then we have what we think are most intriguing. Um, what I'd like to um, call out for everybody and, and for those following along, we are now just scrolling down onto the PDB. Uh, but uh, one of the things we are doing is really um, mainstreaming international coverage. One of the key foundations of the Aussie philosophy is that um, we are part of a global world. Really, we are. Um, we want to prepare people to be 4.0 citizens and who are the people and the issues and the things that you need to be thinking about. Um, so very important to us that international coverage is mainstreamed into what we are doing. Um, we are currently building out the team in that regard, uh, but uh, it's something that it's not parked off to the side. Our big profiles, I mean, we are taking world leaders and treating them as if they deserve, that they're just as fascinating as some celebrity, right? In fact, quite frankly, way more so. But we think they're that exciting, and we want to write about them like that in a way that really captures why they're important, what their policies mean for people. And, and what's funny, with me as a designated staff skeptic, initially when it, Carlos Watson had, had pitched the idea of the PDB, the Presidential Daily Brief, to me, I had I had thought, you know, that, that doesn't make any sense. I can just go to Google News and click on it. But what's, what's distinctly different about this PDB is that the curatorial aspect of it, the fact that uh, when we don't have a curator, and we've got some fantastic star celebrity curators coming up, um, we have a, a team at Oxford who's kind of, they're reading O Globo, they're reading, uh, they're reading uh, uh, Berliner Zeitung, they're reading uh, newspapers all over to give us, you know, a real sense of the life of the people in whatever countries we happen to be going to, and digesting it in a way that it, it's, you know, after the 10, you are the most interesting person at the party, or intriguing person at the very least. So um, I, I became a quick believer in the efficacy of, of the PDB, and somebody asked us yesterday about statistics. This is one of our, our clear and big early winners in our eight days of existence. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, we, and we saw that in the um, beta test um, as Correct. well. So the interesting thing, though, is, I mean, so I came from the Yahoo homepage where, you know, we were updating constantly and staying on top of the news, and, and this was something that had been near and dear to my heart. One of the things that really attracted me to Carlos was that was only part of what he was up to. He had a much bigger uh, vision, and I know some of you asked about the change generation that we're targeting. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but what was interesting to me is that he didn't just do this. He had it wrapped into a much bigger thing. And as far as Carlos is concerned, this isn't a media site. This is the beginning of a movement. Um, like Rolling Stone uh, captured a zeitgeist and like the Whole Earth Catalog uh, captured a zeitgeist. Our hope is to um, be that. Uh, and that's very ambitious. Um, our motto, however, is think big and be humble, <laughs> which is uh, how we're interpreting uh, the Ozymandias uh, poem, which uh, many people have uh, read in, 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 in many different ways. Um, so in terms of thinking big, um, we have eight stories a day. Uh, we're still experimenting uh, with the mix. Uh, and the number, but for now, this is what we're sticking with. So we're just going to um, swoop around the site. We'll walk mm -hmm. through it a little bit. Um, and then I think maybe the best thing to do is to um, open it up to um, questions. So we're going to start in the upper right-hand corner with Rising Stars. This is the person who we hope is on the way up. This is the person that you're going to be reading about in three months or six months. Um, last Saturday, um, we'd actually had a piece on Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil, uh, standing by. Uh, and uh, we, had, we knew she was coming to the U.S. And then, of course, she pulled out. Um, I would have liked to have run that a month or so ahead of the U.S. visit. That was my plan. But um, news gets in the way, uh, or actually news opportunities arise, really. Let's, mm -hmm. let's be realistic about it. Uh, and so we rushed that in. Um, and thank you, Dilma, for getting up and blasting the U.S. In, at the U.N. yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. A daily, I would have had about a month out on that or so, so that you really had a chance to think about her, but at least we uh, got there um, ahead of that. We're not the first people to do it, but I think we um, captured her in a way that said, here's why you need to know about this person uh, right now. Um, all right, so the next thing um, is called good sh <laughs> uh, a, a, a topic, uh, a label that has been uh, greatly discussed at the uh, Aussie office. Uh, but this is just a quick hit. It's a good thing, a good trend. Um, actually, actually, sorry, a good thing as opposed to um, a trend. Uh, 
and we've done different things. Uh, yesterday, uh, Eugene had a great piece about uh, fold-up cars, mm -hmm. yes. um, which I immediately wanted. They're only sixteen thousand dollars. I was just like, I just had a car lost. I can I look forward to taking that on the train. Um, and then the um, next one is something called um, C Notes, uh, which is um, part one of sort of our um, op-ed. Uh, C notes uh, originally stood for Carlos Watson. Um, Carlos uh, has a lot of opinions uh, about things. This was a fantastic piece, uh, which I just really loved reading. Um, Carlos uh, is very um, clear about um, thinking differently, and uh, you may think that uh, you look at somebody and think, well, they're going to be a liberal, they're going to have a liberal <laughs> perspective, but Carlos is actually very interested in the GOP and in sort of talking to them about um, moving forward. So it's not just uh, one, one side of a story. If you haven't yet, I really would encourage you to um, read this because his um, central point is that um, he is seeing a class of African-American males that are a GOP dream, and the GOP really should be taking advantage of that. And I think maybe not the kind of piece you're going to see elsewhere, and that's one of the things that we're, we're, we're trying to do. Um, Performance, uh, we're just going around the horn, but performance was actually supposed to be sort of the last thing, just a, a dessert, if you will. Um, acumen, then moving over to the bottom of the um, left, uh, sort of a Freakonomics style thing, um, sometimes can be longer, sometimes can be shorter, um, just very heavy on the numbers. Um, right now, resolved, we um, have an introduction uh, running. Uh, what we're finding is, is that as people come, they, they do click on this, uh, so we're, we're running it a little bit longer than we expected. Normally, resolved, um, if CNO uh, makes a statement, resolved asks a question. Um, so some of our resolves have been things like, you know, should um, people who drive drunk be uh, punished more? Um, is spanking okay? Things like that. Flashback um, is just a look back. And uh, this thing, by the way, has been blowing up on Twitter today. I have been informed. Um, a really lovely piece about Harper Lee and how um, some friends of hers made all the difference and as a result of their generosity gave us one of the um, top books of ever in, in the U.S. And then finally, fast forward, um, that's the thing that is the trend. Um, our hope is that by looking at these two things at the top, rising stars and fast forward, um, we're talking to you about things that, as Eugene would say, mm -hmm. make you the most interesting person at the party, but also really give you some idea about what is um, going on uh, in the world. And what's interesting to me, we are a U.S.-based media site. Our two top pieces are international, and it just feels completely natural to me. Uh, and, and and it's also the top right is also slugged. You don't see it here because it's he's clearly figured by us as a rising star, but it's uh, the, the full name of the section is rising star and provocateur. Mm -hmm. And you see if you scroll down, we're listing him as a provocateur. But we've uh, we had a piece on Kadyrov uh, from Chechnya, and we figured it would be incorrect to list him as a rising star. So we it's perfect. If it's a provocateur, it'll be slugged the provocateur. If it's a rising star, it's a rising star. And this kind of creates a nice situation where we're not endorsing people. Pe there are people who are interesting, but we're not necessarily endor endorsing them. So, um, but this guy is cle point. clearly both. So. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, let's see. I'm sorry. I have managed to uh, delete my uh, clock, so I don't know how we are in terms of time, and if we should talk a little bit further <laughs> or open it up for uh, questions. If what, you have you anything have else you'd like to add, feel free. Mm -hmm. But if not, we can certainly open it up to questions. Okay, great. Um, well, I will say um, I actually buried the lead. Um, we're hiring. <laughs> 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 um, we um, expect to expand the uh, team. Uh, we have um, a couple of roles open. Uh, we're particularly looking for somebody who can write about business and the economy, and I know from looking at some of the um, people that um, uh, are in this group that there might be a few people with those kinds of backgrounds. Uh, we are also looking for um, contributors. Uh, I know uh, that Anne's got a great internship program set up, so we are looking for any level, whether it's um, a contribution, regular contributions, interns, and we do have job openings and we expect to have more. Um, and we are looking for people who can write um, about either large geographic regions, India, Asia, Latin America, or we are looking for people who can go deep into verticals, politics, business, technology, science, medicine. 
Um, and th that's just the tip of the iceberg. So if I didn't call out something that you have a specialty in, um, you know, please, please reach out. Um, but we were very interested in coming to talk to you all today. In fact, as I said to Lauren and Haley um, yesterday, we would just like to hire all of you. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> see me <laughs> uh, afterwards. Take uh, note of the seven day a week, 18 hour a day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keeps you young. Uh, all right. So um, uh, that uh, th that is 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 very important, but um, uh, when I graduated uh, from journalism school um, at Berkeley, my commencement speaker got up and basically said, there are no jobs anywhere, good luck. Uh, and uh, I just uh, stuck with it uh, in part, I think, because I was just stubborn. Uh, but um, uh, I think it is a really wonderful opportunity, uh, not only um, if, if you come to work uh, with Ozzy, to um, write some different kinds of things that aren't being covered elsewhere. Uh, to also get a look at a startup environment up close and personal. Um, one of the things I first realized about Ozzy when I was first coming down and, and, and I consulted for a bit before um, I, I came on part time is constantly moving the furniture around. I mean, you would come in and the table would be here and the next day it was there and, and, and it was you could actually sort of see the company growing. Um, when I started in May, there were four people and now there's 15. So mm -hmm. it's really exciting to be part of something like that. So if you've ever, like I had, wanted to be part of a really amazing ride, this is it. Um, one of the things that I've talked to um, riders and people who've been coming on board is, you know, there's not a lot of media launches going on these days for obvious reasons. It's hard and it's expensive and it's extremely competitive <coughs> even if you can now, you know, post something. Uh, and there's lots of things out there that, that make it possible even um, easier than Web 1.0. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of that going on. Um, Carlos has an amazing background, as um, as I like to say. Who do you know has on his resume MSNBC anchor and Goldman Sachs director? <laughs> not too many people. So that's that's a pretty uh, amazing combination. But you know, clearly somebody who knows about media and about the business. Very very important. Uh, and I think that um, the other thing is, um, if these do uh, launch, they don't tend to launch in the Silicon Valley, right? We're all about technology. So if you want to do media in the Silicon Valley, that's a very unusual and rare occurrence, And um, but Ozzy's doing it. Um, and one of the really special things that he had said to me, as again the cynical journalist that really appealed to my, my sense of place, was he said, Ozzy is all about turning the corner. In other words, you can't realistically expect to see what we've done in other places. And I'll give you a prime example of that. When there was a Boston Marathon bombing, um, people focused on the event, they focused on a backstory. The, I mean, this was in advance of us publishing, but the first place we went with that was Chechnya is, uh, Syria is screwed. Uh, we looked at the fact that maybe uh, uh, Russia and the U.S. would trading card, Chechnya with Syria, and that Assad would be uh, 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 the odd man out. Now, this was just speculative early day thinking before the story came out, before we were kind of tuned into Kadyrov, but the idea was that we were aggressively seeking to, to get around that story in a way that nobody else had gotten around it in terms of mm -hmm. analysis and thinking about, well, what does this mean in a deeper sense? And again, that goes back to the idea of curating this very much like we said initially, uh, it, it, it's a party, and we're striving to be kind of the most compelling voice at the party. You know. Um, yeah, I think that's important. Yeah. One of the other things that um, we have done a little bit of, but we'll be doing more of, mm. and that Carlos feels very strongly about, is by the way, it's not just experts. Um, we've already had one piece by the former um, deputy director and briefly acting director of the CIA, um, who's a counterterrorism expert. Um, mm. He wrote a beautiful piece for us last week about Syria. And you can expect to see more fascinating things from him, hopefully by Friday, um, <laughs> if the piece comes in on time. Uh, and and uh, we, we mostly act like a digital magazine, but some things I'm finding already after, even in week two, we're like slamming things in the next day. I feel like I'm like back in the, back in the, 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 real, the real newsroom, if you will. Um, but that um, other voices are really important. And I also like that about Carlos. Um, we have a piece about somebody um, who's a barber who uh, couldn't read until he was 25 years old. 
Uh, he taught himself to read, and uh, he's now written two books. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be writing for us. And Carlos loves the idea that a guy like that is going to be on the site at the same time as the former director of the CIA. And he thinks that's very special, and I agree. And that goes back to then thinking about a larger community and building a community that says um, it's less about um, demographics, i.e. how old you are, where mm -hmm. you live, and it's a lot more behavioral, and it's people who have that kind of open mind to say Anthony Hamilton has a valid a point to make as John McLaughlin and John McLaughlin by the way has very valid points to make and I think that's really important and that's another um, special thing about um, Ozzy. Excellent. Uh, let's go to questions now. Um, do you guys have access to the, the blog with the questions in it or should, should we read them? Uh, you know, I don't have it handy. You, oh, well, we've got the the printouts. If you wanted to uh, do that, there was. There it, it wouldn't be bad to deviate from this. Yeah, yeah if, you, if there's if there's something that's, that's 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 um, hotter, I would say there were some questions about the audience, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more. But if there's something else you guys want to jump into, um, sure. Okay. Fire away. Maybe we should do. Why don't we start with the question? That was the theme that came up on the live blog was the target audience. And yep. maybe if yes. you want to, you saw some of those questions, um, maybe you can sort of address that. Yeah. Um, and then we can go to maybe some live questions, I think. Yeah, in good. fact, I think it was Fane who may have asked yeah. who is the target audience. Yeah. So right. there we do go. Yeah, initially, uh, Carlos had this idea, and it came to him during the first Obama election at the rally in Chicago when I think he looked out across the crowd and kind of was aware of the fact that it seemed to be lurking right kind of outside of our vision, this idea that there was a different time and uh, that people were emerging in a different place, what he wants to call the change generation, people who are uh, not so happy with consensus reality, who are interested in uh, analyzing the story in a different way than you get from the traditional media, media outlets. And he saw that in Anthony Hamilton, uh, he saw that in, the, there's the, the, the young guy that he met recently uh, who would come in through Emerson Collective. Oh, right, right. Um, oh. And so whether... Here, I think. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. So uh, <clears throat> regardless of age, he found out that there was a kind of a searching uh, a thing happening, and it tied into the news. These people were captivated. They were captivated by Jon Stewart in a way that they weren't by the New York Times, the USA Today. You know, they were captivated by... Um, the election in, and enlivened by the election in a way that they hadn't been before and he wanted to do something that specifically addressed these active seekers in each age grouping you know uh, somebody who's concerned about politics at 16 shares a lot in common with somebody who's concerned about politics at 36 um, and if their needs are not being addressed by mass media then uh, I don't know where they're going but Carlos had this idea that we could convene them all under one tent um, it's, a, it's a big bold vision um, what I do like about it um, is that I kind of had to learn the hard way when I was um, developing things through the course of my career, is that the easy thing to do is to say, we're going to go for women 25 to 45. Um, but that's, so that's the demographic way, right? Females, ages. But then you think about it and you think, really, if you look at it behaviorally, you say new moms. A new mom could be 16 or a new mom could be somebody who adopted in her 50s and they both want to know about diapers. So mm -hmm. demographic can sometimes be very helpful and advertisers will say that's what they want, but when you really think about audiences and people and what they're interested in, behavioral is, uh, it, to my mind, a much smarter way to go. So yeah, Carlos um, has identified an audience that we really do think is out there and it is behavioral it is people who are interested in the new and the next. Um, I like to remind Carlos pretty much about once a week that when I saw Obama speak at the 2004 election, I turned to my husband and said, that's our next president. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember my husband for the longest time was a Hillary Clinton supporter. And I just kept saying, it's Obama, it's Obama. Um, there were a lot of people like that who felt that. And particularly by 2007, the people who got on board early, or at least the people who were willing to think, you know what? This is kind of crazy, but maybe it could happen, and why not? Mm -hmm. And looked at things through a very different lens, um, that that was uh, extremely important. So um, to answer the question about the audience, really at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's about that mindset. And by the way, um, that is not just a liberal, upper demographic, highly educated uh, uh, group of people. Um, Carlos uh, and, and, and we believe 
that there are moms who haven't gone to college working as secretaries who are interested in that. And by the way, they're going to make damn sure that their kids go to college and they want to know about these things. Or, um, or really dialed in cab drivers. Exactly. Right? And, and I mean, that there are a lot of intelligent people out there who don't necessarily fit into mm -hmm. um, what um, you could call the Cosmopolitans, right? The New York Times and the NPR audience. That's definitely there, but there's a whole lot of other people who are interested in things. Uh, and uh, what I'm really on a mission for, um, and it goes to one of the other questions uh, that people ask me about my time at Yahoo and how is it influencing me here, um, and it's something that's influenced uh, pretty much my entire career, is that um, people are really interested in serious subjects, and we in the media, I think, in the past have traditionally not given them credit for that. What we have fed is spinach. Or what I used to, what we used to call back in my Chronicle days, DBI, dull but important. Like, yeah, this is a boring story, but we got to do it because we just got to, right? And guess what? When people read that, they don't think it's exciting and interesting, and it's not really helping them. And what I really learned at Yahoo, in part because I had these amazing um, dashboards, heat maps, um, using um, some pretty sophisticated personalization technology, is that a lot of people are interested in very many different things. Sixteen-year-olds were clicking on a story, what is close? Yeah. Big topic, nobody was really addressing it, and you know, we know that there's an interest for that if you can package it in a way that is relevant mm -hmm. and provides context. Um, and that that is a huge opportunity out there. And I'm, I see a lot of people doing great work all the time, but I think to be uh, very laser focused on that um, is a huge um, opportunity and one of the reasons why I'm attracted to Ozzy. And I, I was at the LA Press Club a couple of years ago. <clears throat> I was talking to a friend of mine who was an editorial director at a company in Los Angeles, and he, we, we were bemoaning, it was, we were talking about editorial, and he had said, face it, Eugene, you know, we're just not the audience for our magazine. It, the assumption being that we were doing magazines for people who were not as smart as we were. And I said, you know, I can't wake up in the morning and go do what I do if that's, if that's what I'm thinking, you know. I, I need to have, to, I've got to assume to a certain degree that the people that we're writing for and to are us, you know. Um, and uh, it's, it's really nice to have that brought home with Ozzy that uh, <laughs> I'm not getting done by, by Liz for, for word choices because people just won't know what that is um, on a very micro level but in a very general level um, we are grasping the mantle and seeing that or assuming that it, it's a larger demographic than anybody's going to credit to heretofore so mm -hmm. um, no, I, I, I think that's, that's really important yeah. um, one of the other things I, I learned at um, Yahoo and it goes back to that behavioral um, uh, idea about thinking about things is that a lot of personalization technology will say, you clicked on a sports story, so we're going to show you more sports stories. Well, that's not how it rolls, um, because one of the things I learned, again, I fought very hard against that, and um, Yahoo developed a way of doing personalization that accepted that people had a broad range of interests. I said, look, I know women traditionally don't click on sports stories, i.e. traditional gamer stories, who won or who lost type of things. Some women do, but in general that's more male. But I also know that women during the Olympics are extremely engaged. So I said to the technology people, I need um, a technology that will understand that and capture that. So the way the Yahoo personalization technology worked was because there were so many people um, on Yahoo that we could expose all of our content to a very small percentage of the site and start to see what people were clicking on. And what we saw was that men were clicking on stories about Ugg boots and women were clicking on sports stories. And I can tell you they click on a certain kind of sports story. Usually it has a heartwarming, some high school team has done something wonderful and you, you know, kind of shed a tear at, at you know, this magnificent gesture they've just made. So again, audiences will surprise you about what they're interested in and I again think that um, the media and I've been part of that. It's like sort of thinking, well, it's women and they only want this, or it's, you know, people who are interested in politics only want this kind of thing and they don't want this other kind of thing. And um, again, I hope you see this uh, reflected in Ozzy that um, it's a big world out there and people are really interested in a wide variety of things and they're busy and there's a lot of stuff out there. And if you can tell them why do you need to know about this person now and what's the real context, um, that um, I think there's a really deep hunger for that. Great. Should we get some more? Yeah, yeah we have, um, I think, about 20 minutes to go, and I think we have, okay. we're going to have a lot of questions. Okay. So let's, uh, maybe. Fame, do you want to go ahead? Sorry, my other question was how, do, what, so this is very important to me as a freelancer. I'm like, what is your pay structure? <laughs> <laughs>
first thing I asked. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is very funny. Um, well, I will tell you that I am currently working for a fraction of my former mm -hmm. salary. We mm -hmm. are a startup. Uh, one of the things I really like about um, Carlos is that even though he has some amazing backers, including Lorene Powell Jobs and Ron Conway and some of the biggest names in the Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. this is not Web 1.0. We are not throwing money around. Um, mm -hmm. We are being very tight with the dollar. Uh, so um, that answer, and we can talk about it afterwards, uh, really depends on how long is it, how complex is it. Mm -hmm. um, we are, from the um, survey that we did, we are competitive w with what the New York Times and The Economist mm -hmm. pays for, for, for stories. But um, I, I was kind of shocked at how low those prices were. Yeah, sadly. they're very low. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they really are. So we are competitive. Um, I actually... Um, think that ultimately where I'd like to go is to be more than competitive mm -hmm. so that we can attract and pay for writers. Um, I was a freelance writer for the first 10 years of my career and I have always worked at media companies that has paid for their media content and paid for it fairly. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we are a startup and um, Samir Rao, the um, co-founder, um, is amazing at negotiating. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I usually bring somebody in and say, okay, right, now go negotiate with AP and we always come out with a, a really good deal. And, so competitive, and, but yeah. not, not, not astounding. And very directly, I had done some work for, for Viacom about 10 years ago and that, as huge as they are, that was the worst I've ever gotten paid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of it, you just feel really gamed, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, you, don't and, to, you don't want to feel screwed. Right, yeah. and, and, and we're on the complete opposite end of the mm -hmm. spectrum. Yeah. I have to say comfortably. You yeah. Know. Um, I think the other thing that we talk about is that um, we believe strongly in recognition. Uh, so we have a pretty robust um, social media program. And the other thing that we can offer the regular contributors, and again, something for you all to be thinking about, is um, we have a weekly segment on NPR. Um, and, you know, let's just pause and think about that for a moment. NPR doesn't do deals like that, really. <laughs> um, but they did that with Ozzy because they met Carlos and they so... Um, uh, gravitated towards the vision that he has. Uh, so every uh, Saturday on All Things Considered, uh, we have a uh, five to six minute segment called The New and the Next. And Carlos feels very strongly uh, that it will not just be him, soon it will be Eugene and it will be other people on the team. And uh, I was talking to a writer um, who had a book reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review section and had also done an NPR appearance and guess which one had the bigger impact on his sales. NPR by a landslide. So anyway, um, that's the way we roll. Um, we're paying uh, reasonable prices, but we are also, again, treating people fairly and saying, come on board because there's lots of opportunities here that can help further your career. Do we want to go Sarah, I believe, had a question? Um, sure. Uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I was wondering how day-to-day -day operations <laughs> vary between working in a traditional newsroom and also having Aussie, which has that um, element of the startup culture thrown in. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting. I don't know you do. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. Um, I have always prided myself on being um, a great organizer. When I was at the San Francisco Chronicle, I had eight daily and Sunday feature sections. I had a staff of 120 people. I thought I could juggle. This is a whole new dimension. I am really. Um, being stretched in ways that I never thought possible, which is exciting and occasionally highly annoying. Um, uh, we're still working that out. That's the interesting thing. In fact, um, when I went to Yahoo, actually, I realized in a lot of ways the um, newspaper background that I had grown up with, meetings at 10, meetings at 2.30, we'd be planning meetings, all those things, shockingly, that's what was needed. I went in saying, oh, I, you know, I'm going to be all dot-com-y, coming from usatoday.com, where the meetings were very fluid. And actually, at Yahoo, I found that that traditional structure worked really well. Um, I am pretty sure that what we're going to wind up with here is more of a hybrid. Um, I just canceled our 10 o'clock daily meeting because it wasn't effective, and I love nothing better than killing a meeting that isn't effective, uh, because in newsrooms and in companies around the world, too, many time is, too much time is wasted in meetings, uh, because it just wasn't the right cadence, and it wasn't giving us what we needed. So um, we are developing that, and that's been very interesting that some of my old um, tricks or you know experiences have not been as relevant. We are a daily magazine with a, a, a slice of news down the middle. So trying to figure out how to pull all that together um, 
is one of the things that we are um, frankly uh, working on. So there are weekly meetings and there are regular things and there's I've got spreadsheets galore and master calendars, et, et cetera. Um, and that's very important. But uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of in the process of figuring that out. Would you, and, and I mean the point that you raised, there, there's a kind of really delightful schizophrenia with, <laughs> with uh, my background is, is purely in magazines. I never, when I was here at Stanford studying communications, I never journalism. I never wanted to do anything other than magazines, um, but of course it's been a difficult time for magazines. So I've launched <coughs> magazines and I've launched websites, but this is the first time I've, I've been involved in the launch of a pure digital publication. And so we're, we're, we are creating as we go along. We're taking bits and pieces from here and there, which is really cool because it, there are not many opportunities you get to do this. I mean, if you go into a magazine, it's an established structure, even if it's a new magazine. If you, in the old days, it was just a website, well, there were certain, you know, mm -hmm. this is completely different. So, like she said, it's, it's a hybrid, it's uh, neither fish nor fowl, and what we're doing is developing a process for moving ahead that's kind of cool. Because I, I'm doing this for a long time now, since 1984, and this is the first time I've had a chance to do this. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I would say that in general one of the things I've learned is that um, many of the best practices from the newspaper era of the 80s and 90s really do um, hold in the digital world. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then there are other things that don't. Um, but I remember as a feature editor, you know, I, I knew what was working for my audience. I didn't have the data to back it up, but I just knew what was working. And so now, yes, um, I, you know, we know that breaking news does well, and we know certain types of stories do well. Um, and sometimes things that at a daily newspaper would be a sidebar on page six, um, actually you should have on the front page because that was the real thing that people were interested in, for instance. All those things that you've been trained in and that you know, um, I think are, are very valid, uh, but it is interesting to try to mm -hmm. figure out just sort of like basic things like meetings and we've got a distributed team and um, it does really crack me up that Carlos's idea of sort of hiring junior people is to just basically, he hired Rhodes Scholars <laughs> in Oxford to like uh, work on our brief, among other things. So we've got a team, we've got people in Germany, we've got people in um, the UK. Um, our call-ins are amazing. Our calendars have like 15 numbers that everyone can dial into. And for some reason, I've got somebody in Canada who can't dial in and it's driving me nuts. Um, but it's, it's that, that kind of thing. Um, that's actually very different. Although at Yahoo, I, I had a, a, a lot of that. Um, but yeah, people in different places and people in New York and somebody who's here now is going to be in New Orleans. And so thinking about how do you work with a real distributed newsroom where, you know, pretty soon it's going to be me and Eugene and Rebecca Moreno, um, deputy editor, uh, sort of sitting around with most of our team uh, spread out elsewhere is also going to be um, a challenge. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, if anybody has worked at places where you've been able to um, manage that well, I'm very interested in hearing any um, tips anybody has. Um, Amanda, and just in the interest of time, maybe um, you could alternate answering questions going forward just because okay. we want to get sure. a few more questions in. Oh, okay. Great. So uh, there was a piece on the, I think, Columbia Journalism Review uh, saying that the homepage was dead mm -hmm. and that people were clicking on stories like through Google, social media, and your product is a homepage. And wh uh, wh what's your opinion on that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, that's a, a, a fantastic question. Um, and I, in general, for most media sites, I think that is true. In fact, when I was at USA Today in 2004, we started to understand that it was the story page was really your home page. That's how people were coming in. Aussie is different uh, for a number of reasons, uh, in part because we have deals with NPR where they'll just say Aussie.com. And so our home page is going to be uh, different. Uh, there's also the rise of tablets and thinking about content that way. And I think we may be, in some cases, evolving back to having a homepage. If you think about what Flipboard or Zite does for you, for instance, right? So that, you know, eight stories and things that you can flip through, um, that the, the homepage may become um, more relevant. Uh, we're in an interesting stage right now. So for us, we're very aware that our landing pages are important, and in fact, we are um, uh, looking at them very carefully to make sure that they are as optimized as they possibly can be, but we're also focusing on the home page. We care about SEO. We know that that's really important, but we are also very aware of social. So it's, it's, it's getting to be like a, a, a 4D situation, I think, um, as we look at, at, at how you uh, create media these days. Uh, go ahead, Marianne. Um, so a common criticism of new media is that there's not as much depth, obviously, with a Twitter, um, a Twitter tweet um, in comparison to a newspaper article. And I was just wondering, um, given the range of topics on Aussie, um, what are your strategies for achieving that level of depth? 
Uh, I'll take this one. Um, if you, if we were to click through the story, and this was something that had been hard coded in the early stages, that the idea was to uh, to remove competitive space in a very specific story. So we have a section called "Go Deep" that sits at the bottom of uh, at the bottom of each piece, and we view this as our kind of call to action. So that we're drawing a circle. It's it's great to consume media passively, but what we saw that was pretty necessary, and what we all were wanting. Was this idea that you could then you could then part participate in the story? Um, sorry, um, and, and we also have audio that's audio that's going to be increasingly integrated into the page, uh, as well as, as video. Um, so we are covering it within the very specific format of a single story. We are covering it from you know 360 degrees. Um, so it's not yeah what we do will be easily. You can tweet it out very, very easily, but there's also depth upon depth upon depth, and um, and that was again built in from the very beginning. Uh, the difference is, if you go to NewYorkTimes.com today, you have m many choices on the front page. You have 100 articles, maybe. I'm guessing off the top of my head. Um, we we are we are narrow focused, but very deep, and I think that. Uh, um, I think that's a saving grace for us. And in terms of people who are caring about the world, uh, it's maybe impossible for me to care about more than eight things at a time anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will just um, piggyback on that one. Um, one of the things that um, we discovered after we um, designed this and we got our um, templates and we were starting to use the CMS was that the longer stories look awful. Right. So we were having to go back in and say, you know what, you can put as many pull quotes and you know things to make the page look okay, but also people are consuming news on these right. now and it's just amazing what looks okay on the, the laptop doesn't look okay on mobile and we want to be very mindful of that. Um, so um, I'm the person who once wrote two full broadsheet pages about pigeons. I think there were eight sidebars <laughs> with that story. Um, I uh, lo love to go along like nobody's business. Um, but what, one of the things we've had to do is get really focused on the writing. And I will say one of the challenges has been, and I've seen writers do this, is that they're trying to cram so much stuff into one poor little sentence. It's like, stop, you know, we're, we, we have to make... <laughs> <laughs> we, have to, we have to make a decision here. You've got five facts in there. Pick the most relevant one. So um, just like the PDB, um, it requires a level of rigor. You really have to think through about what you're writing about and um, really boil it down to the essence. Um, one of the first pieces we ran um, was um, an interview, uh, or uh, it was by Carlos, it was a Cena where he um, talked to um, the author of the book about the, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's Game Change by Mark Halperin. Right. And Carlos said to him, wow, that's such a fantastic book. And he said, yeah, you know how I did it? I took 95% of everything I knew and I left it on the cutting room floor. And that's why it was a great book. And mm -hmm. that was almost like sort of our sort of like mission statement. Like we're leaving 95% of it on the cutting room floor just to bring you that 5% that we hope is the best. And, and like it or not, the stats are out there. We, you know, I mean, the web has made it possible for journalists to look at articles in a way that they never did before, you know, and the reality of it is it'd be great to write a 2,500 word piece but people are not reading that far, you know. So it, there, there's a sweet spot, and, and, and we are finding that we're closer to it than not, maybe. Yeah. Um, I will say that one of the questions was, is there a future for long reads? And I think absolutely yes, and companies like Medium and Long Reads are, are right. absolutely proving that. And I think tablets are changing that somewhat. Right. Uh, for <laughs> now, we're very uh, tightly focused, but who knows, there could be something in our future. On Sunday, we do what we call the Camp David edition of our presidential mm -hmm. daily brief, mm -hmm. and one of the things we highlight is a long read. So, you know, we accept that it's out there and that those, those have their place. That's just not what we're doing right now. So we have two more minutes, so I think we'll just take one more question. We, is anyone playing? Okay. Maybe Naomi, do you want to ask the last question? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm actually, it's also about your style, but um, how did you, or can you give me some insight into the discussion that went into developing Ozzy's tone? It's very specific. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I, I can do that. Uh, we, we initially, we kind of hit on this analog and we started to use it a lot that uh, Carlos was his empresario, he was ma master of ceremonies, these different words. And finally we figured out that what it was, it's just, it's a great party, you know. And, and there's certain certain dynamics at a party that happen, but we wanted it to be uh, uh, convivial, uh, accessible, and um, not to stink of old media, you know, um, <laughs> which is, 
if you read the pieces, there are familiar touchstones, but generally we want it to be as open as reading, or open and as easy as reading Facebook, you know. Um, and if you're at a party, I could read you some of the stuff from the New York Times. I'm not, I don't want to harp on the Times, but you're good for about 30 seconds before you start wandering off to get some chips, <laughs> you know. The idea was to be engaging in a way that was very serious, like at a great party. And, I mean, which means that we've embraced this idea that what we're doing, to a certain degree, it's informative, but it's also entertaining. It should be. Um, if you're not having a good time at Aussie, we're not doing our job. Yeah, it should know? be so. engaging. Um, it is really interesting, because when I worked at USA Today, you know, the nation's mm -hmm. newspaper, mm -hmm. you know, pretty G-rated. And I thought, well, what could be more G-rated than that? And, well, it turned out Yahoo was more G-rated, because Yahoo actually had programs where the homepage was in uh, kids' classrooms. And so we had to be very careful about what we did. Um, so it's kind of refreshing to be in a place where um, I sadly swear like a sailor. It's too many years in newsrooms. Um, and, you know, we're judicious about it. You know, we're not doing it, um, you know, just to do it. But when there's, there's, there's times that it can be, I think, really effective. Um, one of our first pieces was about unwed mothers in Iceland. And the last uh, mm -hmm. phrase, I think it was just, uh, it was like, chill the, chill the hell out. And it, but it was just like, it made sense, right? Because it was just talking about unwed mothers, and it was like, why does the U.S. get their shorts and a bunch about this stuff when it, it's actually okay if there are social services and if the country accepts it? And it was just a beautiful piece. And we could have said, chill the heck out, or we could have said, chill out, and it just wouldn't have made the impact. So it was great to be able to have that, but you want to be judicious about it. And, and it would have been inaccurate if, if heck was what they said. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, right. thank you so All much. All right, for you guys. Well, thank you so much.